Christian author Tim Hansel was talking about a couple that were close friends of he and his wife. And he said that uh, these friends were all excited because they were going to get on a plane and fly back to where they were originally from and they were going to attend their 40th high school reunion. And uh, so that was all that filled their thoughts, all they talked about for you know a, a week or so. And Tim said he took them to the airport and they were so excited and uh, they said their goodbyes and then later on that weekend he picked them up from the same airport and they got in the car and he said well how did it go what happened and he said their reply was it wasn't what happened it was what didn't happen he said it's been 40 years 40 years and they haven't changed they'd simply gained weight changed clothes and gotten jobs but they hadn't really changed and what I experienced his friend said was probably one of the most tragic things that I could ever imagine about life he said for reasons I can't fully understand it seems like some people choose not to change I hope that is not definitive of God's people if there are any people that ought to be open to change it ought to be believers because that is really part and parcel of what the Christian life is about it's about letting God change you and uh, often when I give gospel tracts out I say here I have something that changed my life for the better people don't want change but I want change I want my life to change. I, I don't think that uh, there's ever going to time in my earthly life where I don't need change, spiritual change. You know, reunions are not always the most pleasant uh, uh, times, but we have a family reunion that is recorded here in chapter 46 that really was a good one. Uh, it was certainly one to remember. It was certainly one for the record book, and uh, we have it recorded here in God's Word. Uh, my wife and I and uh, our family members are planning tentatively to uh, have a family reunion with her uh, folks in the month of June, and uh, we're looking forward to that. We're hoping it'll be a good experience. Here's a good experience of family reunion that we see here, and it really, I look at it this way. Uh, the first 27 verses are about their trip, their travel, their journey to Egypt. And then the rest of the, uh, of the uh, chapter 46 is uh, what happened on their arrival. So travel and arrival, just uh, two simple things. Let's uh, look at them as quickly as we possibly can, but let's pause a moment and pray first. Again, Lord, we turn to you. Uh, whom have we in heaven but you? Whom would, do we desire on this earth but you? And so, Lord, we come to you because we desire you, we need you. And so, Lord, we confess our inadequacy. Our sufficiency is of you. And so we are depending upon you today to both uh, give your word that power of a two-edged sword that is able to pierce and divide between soul and spirit and lay bare the very thoughts and intents or motives of the human heart. We pray for that today to the glory of your name. You know what each human being listening needs and so Lord we're just asking you to do what you do and only you can do for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. So let's look at the first part, uh, the travel part. Really, it's a big family road trip, and I mean big. Talking ancient times with, what, uh, donkeys and uh, oxen pulling carts? How do you get a father 
who is 130 years old. That's how old Jacob is at this time. How do you get a 130-year-old man to leave a place that he has called home for many years and move away? Well, I think it involved, first of all, his all-consuming passion to see his son that he had not seen for 22 years. And also that his son has promised to provide for him and the entire family for the rest of their lives. That's a motivation. And uh, I was thinking about that uh, just this week because I deal with an 80-year-old man on, on almost a weekly basis. And he asked me an interesting question when I was pressing him uh, regarding salvation. He said to me, well, statistically, how many, what's the percentage of, of people my age, elderly people, that uh, at the end of their life like this turn to Jesus and trust Jesus? And, you know, I had to agree with him, uh, probably a very small percentage, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't. <laughs> you know, that's their, that, that, that's their loss. Uh, regardless of your age, this is important. Well, how does that happen? How does that happen that an elderly person at the end of their life, even on their deathbed, so to speak, or their last days on this earth, how is it that they come to Christ? Well, obviously, it's the way it is with any person. The Holy Spirit has to reveal to them their need. Well, the older you get, perhaps the less you see that you have need of God if you've gotten through your life uh, pretty much without his help. And so that, I think, is what causes very few elderly people to want change, spiritual change in their life. The Holy Spirit has to open their eyes. He has to do that in any sinner's life, obviously. But it is the Spirit of God that reveals the necessity of salvation and uh, then shows them the advantages of that. You know what? It's not too late. And you know it is to your eternal benefit to trust the Lord, regardless of your age as personal Savior. So anyway, there, when this travel, for it to get underway, there has to be some persuasion here. He's persuaded, and then it begins. Look at it with me in verse 1. Israel, that is the name for Jacob, he took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. He was persuaded, and then very quickly, having begun, he paused. Why did he stop in Beersheba? What, what's going on here? He left his home in Hebron and uh, stopped at Beersheba. What for? Well, let's read on. Uh, it says that he offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. So that means he built an altar or he utilized an, al uh, an altar that his grandfather or his father had already built. He established an altar and he worshiped. He paused to worship. You know, this is incidental, but just a thought. Do you ever pause to pray when you get in the car or when you get on the train or when you hop on the bus? Do you ever pause to pray and ask God to use you and make this trip not just a, a, a trip to get you from point A to point B, but to use you as a, in a spiritual way, to make this a spiritually profitable drive or trip? He paused to build an altar and to worship. And, uh, and really, to get, I think, the mind of God. He wanted counsel, not from just his sons, but he wanted God's mind. He offered sacrifice unto the God of his father. That doesn't mean that God wasn't his God, but it's linking him to the covenant that God made. Not only with him, but with his father, and of course his father's father, Abraham. He's stopping for counsel from the Lord. Do you stop for counsel from the Lord? When you plan trips, 
When you plan events, you know, James chapter 4 warns us, beginning in verse 13 down to verse 17, that if we make our plans and we don't seek the will of God before we make these plans, we sin. That's a sin. To know to do right, to seek the mind, the counsel, the will of God, and not do it is to a believer, sin. Don't ever forget it. And so he's stopping, he's pausing to worship, to get God's count. He's putting the brakes on his emotions for a moment. He must have been excited. I'm going to see Joseph. Remember, that was his favorite son, right or wrong. That was his favorite. Hadn't seen him for 22 years. Thought he was dead all these years. Just found out he's alive. He's going to be reunited with his long lost son. Filled with emotion. He puts the brakes on his emotions. Need to learn to do that too. We get all enthused with things that, you know, perhaps we come up with or someone else comes up with. And it isn't really from God perhaps even. Or even if it is from God, we let our emotions carry us. We need to pause and seek the mind of God. As he does here, he gets counsel. He realizes his need to seek God's special presence and protection and the powerful blessings of God in his life and his family's life for this new phase in life that they're entering into. And so he pauses for counsel. Do you and I recognize that the number one consideration in everything that pertains to our lives is that we seek God's perspective above all else. That we seek to really know the will of God, the purpose of God, not only for you as an individual, but for your entire family. You have impact upon others. Do we see the number one responsibility to consider what is God's will in this? What is God's purpose? Because uh, God doesn't want you to do your own will. He wants you to do his will. He doesn't want you to have a will of your own. He wants you to have a will that is laid out clearly by him for you. He has that in mind for you. Is that of any interest to you? I'm sure it is. If you're truly a believer, that, uh, that concerns you, that interests you, that God has a specific will and purpose for your life. He has a, a path marked out for you if you'll just pause and get his counsel. And then look at what the response of God is in verses 2 through 4. God spake unto Israel, to Jacob, in visions of the night. Here he has another dream. And he said to him, Jacob, notice two times, emphasizing, getting his attention. This is important. How often did Jesus do that, right? Verily, verily, or the person's name, he repeats it. He says, Jacob, Jacob, and he answers, here am I. He said unto him, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. Oh, wow, what a comfort that is. God telling him. Why should I not fear God? Because I'm going to make you a great nation there. I'll go down with you into Egypt, and I will surely bring you up again. By the way, the whole total, as uh, we read it, in uh, verse 27, 70 people, counting the four, Joseph, his wife, and his two boys. The whole family, 70 people rounded off. Good round number. 70 of them. 400 later, years later, when God delivers them out of Egyptian slavery, more than 2 million. He says, don't fear to go down to Egypt because I'm going to make a great nation of you down there. And certainly it happens. But notice so what else God says to him. Verse 4, I will go down with you. Oh, what a comfort that is. Don't fear, because I got plans for you in going down there. In fact, I'm going to accompany you. You know how uh, wonderful it is to have someone that knows the way? Uh, maybe 
lead and you follow them, if you're going to a place that you're not familiar with or you don't know how to get, th- God says, I'm going to go down with you. And I will sure, surely bring you up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. In other words, you're going to die there. You're going to live the rest of your life down there. And so he's comforting him. He stops, he pauses for counsel, and he gets God's comfort. God meets him. God shows up right at that place of worship. And God knows his name, and God knows his needs. And so God calms his fear, and God reminds him of his covenant with his Father, and the promise of his presence, and the promise that his family will return to Canaan again, and that he would be uh, with him and his family, and that he would be together with Joseph the rest of his life. You have that from the Lord. What comfort that might bring. You know, you have similar promises from the Lord too. That he'll never leave you. Mm -hmm. That he'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. Mm -hmm. He'll never leave you in the lurch. You're God's child and he will never allow you to exist as if you're an orphan. Mm -hmm. You have these same comforting promises if you are a believer. You have that from the Lord. Why would God want him and his family to go to Egypt and yet not want Abraham to go to Egypt, for example, when there was a famine? Well, God has his purpose and plan for every single one of us. And again, they're different. That's why you have to seek the counsel of the Lord as an individual. But God wants Jacob and his family in Egypt at this time during a famine because God is going to use their suffering in Egypt. It was predicted in Genesis chapter 15 when God cut that covenant with Abram. He, he said, your descendants are going to be strangers, foreigners in, in a foreign land for 400 years. And so it's the fulfillment of God's plan that's being uh, uh, taken care of here. God's working his plan. And that suffering that they're going to have when they became enslaved there in Egypt is going to be the power that God uses to mold them into a nation that is under God's deliverance. And so it's very serious that we discern God's will for our individual lives, that we connect with God and allow Him to communicate His purpose to us and lead us in it and us follow Him. So they were persu- he was persuaded, he paused, and then we have a list beginning in verse 5 down through verse 27, which we didn't read today, we skipped over all of this because this is a list of of those that participated the whole family they're all named here one way to get a 130 year old uh, man to move is have the whole family leave with him have the whole family move with him and so God works by calling individuals families and nations to follow him and his will You know, in Middle Eastern life, nothing is more important than family. In fact, in Middle Eastern culture, family is everything. And we have a list here that uh, Moses recorded in the book of Genesis, I think to remind the readers uh, of their identity as God's people that God has a purpose for them as his people to be a light to the nations. So we have a list of the participants, and again, I'm not going through them. But I want you to see uh, something here about these participants that really applies to us as well. And that is, this family, because they were specifically chosen by God, to be the channel through which the nations of this whole earth would be blessed spiritually, uh, primarily spiritually, tells us something. 
that everything that, uh, that God leads us to be participants in is for his cause and not for ours. You know, even lost people recognize the necessity of human beings being connected with a cause greater than, than themselves, right? And again, in Middle Eastern life, they don't think on a mere individual level. They think on a collective community level because family is everything. Everything has to do with not just myself, but with the family. So they don't, uh, uh, they don't make uh, their personal relationship with the Lord pri uh, uh, all that there is or more important than relationships with, uh, with their family. If I can apply that spiritually, I would say this. We're Americans. We pride ourselves in individualism. And there is something to be said for the character uh, of rugged individualism. However, it also has its Achilles heel. And that is, we become consumed so, uh, so much of the time with ourselves. It's all about our personal lives. It's all about us. And we forget that we are a little part of a large community called the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Work on your personal relationship, but folks, don't ignore your responsibility to interact and your, your relationships with those around you. You're not an island. You're not here for yourself, just for you to grow, just for you to prosper, even spiritually. You're here to have an impact upon everyone around you, everyone that you come in contact with, that you might bring the gospel as his witness to the lost, and that you might have a word that uh, will be a comfort or a strength or a blessing to your brothers and sisters all around you. Amen. We're community. Don't forget that. Don't make your personal relationship with the Lord more important than your church as a whole. That's selfish. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that ironic that even in seeking our own spiritual well-being, we can become self-centered people? We need this kind of Middle Eastern mindset that we are a family. We're a community. We're a collective whole. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about others. And we are to, as the New Testament says, treat others better than ourselves. We're to prefer others above ourselves. We have to be willing to sacrifice our desires in order to serve other people. We give up things in order to be a blessing to other people. Because it's not about us. There's a cause much bigger than us that we're connected with. In fact, the lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament are not mainly for you as an individual believer to be blessed, although they do bless you. But mainly, if you look at the whole context, spiritual gifts are for the edification of the body of Christ. They're for others and not mainly for you. And so this matter of, you know, uh, speaking in tongues alone by yourself, uh, you know, whatever. That's not the main purpose of the gift. None of the gifts were given for personal usage. They were given for the good of the church. And so that's what we need to understand here. There is a cause that's greater than us. And there is a connection here of these participants. They're all identified with Jacob. They're his family members. And we are all identified with God as God's people. And we together, not individually, but together, only together can we fulfill the purpose that God has for our lives. You don't fulfill the purpose and I don't fulfill God's will on my own. I have to band together. You know, often we, we read these New Testament letters 
as if they're just written to individuals and obviously there is a, there is individual application but you remember these were written to a whole church the book of Ephesians is to a group of believers and not just one Ephesian obviously one Ephesian is part of a larger group but keep the larger group in mind in fact when you are to put on the whole armor of God we often think of us as individuals and yeah we can make that application but it's the whole church putting on the armor of God it's the it's like the Roman soldiers their shields linked together and they they formed a, a wall to move against the enemy and that's the picture here we are participating in something much bigger than ourselves we're all connected and we must be in order to fulfill God's purpose we will never move without carefulness without prayerfulness considering our connection to the local church our spiritual family our uh, community you can't be a real Christian without the community of God's people. Now I understand there are exceptions to everything, but they're not sought out. <laughs> Those kinds of exceptions come, but the, it is God's plan that if you are a believer, you have a responsibility to connect yourself with the people of God in your locale. And if you don't do that, you're sinning against God. And if you don't do that, uh, you're not a real genuine believer. Genuine believers link themselves and, and participate in a cause greater than themselves in connection with the people of God called the body of Christ in a local church. That's the travel part, the first 27 verses. Now here's the, the last part of it. They get there. They arrive. I want to pick up in verse 28 and then go down to verse uh, 34. You know, one of the things that drives uh, parents crazy when they have little children is when they're on vacation or on the road trip and the, kid, the kid's in the back, are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer? Okay, they've traveled. Now they're arriving. They're there. It says in verse 28, and that's Jacob sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. They're there. They got there. Why Goshen? What is this Goshen stuff? Well, in chapter 45 and verse 18, we read, Take your father and your households, this is Pharaoh speaking, and uh, come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat of the fat of the land. In other words, Goshen was like the best part in Egypt. The best that Egypt had to offer as far as fertility. And, uh, and just the best place. It wasn't near the capital. It was far off from there. And so it was the best place. And then also, it was uh, near uh, Joseph's uh, place as well. In that same 45th chapter in verse 10, Joseph says, Thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me. Of course, uh, probably nearer than Canaan, obvious, but not next door neighbors. But the picture is, why Goshen? Because, number one, it's the best land, yeah. And it's also near Joseph, but it's, I think this is the, the real reason. In chapter 46, where we are uh, this morning, look at verse 31. And Joseph said to his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up. I'll show Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers, my father's house, which are in the land of, they come. And uh, these men are shepherds. Their, the, their trade has been to feed cattle. They brought their flocks. They brought their herds. And uh, when, verse 33, Pharaoh asked you guys, when he, when he uh, you appear before him, when he asked you what your occupation is, tell him that, uh, your uh, servant's trade has been about cattle from uh, your youth and so forth. And he says, uh, for every shepherd is an abomination 
in, uh, unto the Egyptians. Now, here's what you need to understand from that instruction. He's setting it up because Goshen is not only the best land, it's not only a place that's going to be near Joseph, but it's also a place of separation. It's going to keep them separated from the Egyptians. It's going to keep them from being uh, overly impacted by the world, basically. It's going to allow them to keep their, their, their identity as uh, Israelites or as the children of Israel. And so this all figures in. In other words, the Egyptians have a disdain for shepherds and so that's good because you'll be able to preserve your distinctiveness as a result. You know where I'm going with this, right? God's put us here. You say, New York City? Everyone wants to move out of here. In fact, there's more people that moved out of New York City since COVID than uh, probably, uh, I don't know. But fact of the matter is, God put you here, didn't he? And God has you here, and you don't leave here until you know that God wants you elsewhere. And remember, when you go elsewhere, you, you make sure that where you're going, there's a good Bible-believing church there that you can hook up with. You need that community. You need that cause and that connection. And if you don't, and if it isn't there, uh, you better be sure God's leading you there. And if he is, maybe you're instrumental in seeing a church started there. But anyway, back to my point. Uh, God puts us here. We're here. This, this might not be the best place in your thinking, but this is the best place if God puts you here. It's the will of God. That's the best place for you. And not only that, uh, you're near... You're near your brothers and sisters. They become often more important than your own flesh and blood. They become your real family, your spiritual family. Sometimes believers get disowned by their flesh and blood family, but your real spiritual family, they're here for you. And not only that, you can retain your distinctiveness because while you're in the world you have the Holy Spirit of God who has sealed you. He is your seal of protection. He can guarantee your purity and your security in this world. So they've arrived. They're there now. And uh, there is anticipation. That's why Jacob sends Judah ahead. There is an anticipation here to prepare ahead. Joseph made ready his chariot. Uh, verse 29 says, okay, so they're preparing. Uh, they need prep for direction. So he sends Judah to hook up with Joseph and get direction to uh, the specific spot there in Goshen. Which just leads me to ask us this question. Are you following God's plan for reuniting for those that you have been wrongly cut off and separated from? Jacob has been separated and cut off from his son for 22 years. How about you? Is there anticipation in your heart today? And uh, uh, are you following God's plan for reuniting, like Jacob with Joseph, for reuniting with people that you have wrongly been cut off from? I just wonder about that because, as I said, this is, this is his real joy in life. And it really gets down to what life is about. It's relationships, right? We said that last week. This is his r real joy in life, is this relationship that's been neglected all these years. The real joy in life is relationships, and if you neglect them, you end up empty. Your life really has emptiness if you don't cultivate relationships because it's not where you live, it's not what you own, but it's the relationships that you develop for God, for the Lord, 
that are important. So there's an anticipation here on both the part of Jacob and his family and then Joseph as well. And then the, the actual reunion. Look at verse 29. Joseph went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen. And he presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck, notice this, a good while. Now you can believe that. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. There is affection. He's basically, Jacob saying, uh, being, being back together with you, Joseph, is all I want in life. You know what? If you have been wrongly cut off in relationships with others, it's not too late. It's not too late. It was 22 years here, but it's not too late. There's still time. You know, he didn't know it then, but Jacob would have 17 more years to enjoy time together with his, his lost son, Joseph. Those kids, they bug us. Are you there yet? But I want to ask you, are you there yet? Are you there yet? I mean, are you in a place of affection like this with people that you've been separated from wrongly? Are you in a place uh, where there is affection in your heart from God that you love your brethren? You love your brothers of the Lord. Have you made things right with those that, that have been wrongly cut off from you? And uh, have you begun to enjoy a reunion together with them? That's God's will for you. There's anticipation, there's affection, and then really the rest of the passage, verses 31 to 34, which I've already uh, really skimmed over, there's activation. What I mean by that, here is the official activation of the arrangements that were already in place before Jacob and his family arrived. Now it's time to put into action the plan of moving to Goshen. And I would say, now's the time to put into action, to activate God's plan for reuniting with people that you have wrongly cut yourselves off from. That God wants you to have input into their lives to bring blessing, the blessing of God to them. Those that uh, you've separated from wrongly. I can't read the family reunion here of Jacob with Joseph and his family without thinking about a future reunion that's going to take place between Israel and Messiah. I get the same thought every time I read the prodigal son. I think that's Israel coming home to the Father and getting things right, making up. There's coming a day when Israel will look upon him whom they pierced, Jesus the Messiah, and they will mourn for him as if he was their only son. That's pictured here in that reunion, I think. And I would also be reminded of another great uh, reunion that Brother Dave put on the live stream ad, and that is, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's coming a great reunion that's going to actually begin right in the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a great meeting, a great family reunion in the clouds because the Bible says in 1 Thessal Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, God is going to bring back those believers and some of them are flesh and blood family members of ours. He's going to bring them back. And we are going to be caught up to meet them in the clouds to forever be with the Lord. It's going to be a great family reunion that we look forward to. But I also would hasten to say that that will be followed by a face-to-face -face meeting with Messiah on an individual basis according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. In fact, in the future, 
every human being will stand before Jesus as either a member of God's family or an outcast from it. And even some that have presented themselves as members of God's family will end up having fooled themselves and being an outcast. Matthew chapter 7, there are people that are said to have prophesied in the name of Jesus. People that have performed miracles in the name of Jesus that will one day stand before him and he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So every human being, listen to me, is going to stand before God and they are either going to be welcomed as God's family member or cast away as an outcast into outer darkness, into that lake of fire. Believers, as I said, we will face Jesus and he will be a fair and uh, just judge. He will fully and accurately evaluate all of our service for the Lord. And we'll either gain reward or lose reward. Not our salvation, but reward can be lost can be gained or lost. And uh, as horrible as that might be, it really comes down to our choices right now. You can choose selfishly or you can have a highly successful choice and that is surrender. It's up to you. Well, that's the family reunion I wanted to share with you and I close with this illustration, true illustration, way back in the 1700s. A young pastor of a very poor church in England, he was called to a large influential church in London. His name was Pastor John Fawcett. He was a powerful preacher. He was a, a talented writer and because of that it opened up this opportunity for him to pastor this large church in London. But as the wagons were being loaded with all of their belongings from their house, the people from the church came out to give them a tearful farewell. And during all of the goodbyes, John's wife Mary Fawcett said to him, John, I can't bear to leave these people. And he paused a moment and he said, you know what, I can't either. We're going to stay. And they unloaded the wagons, and John Fawcett pastored that same church in that little village in England the entire 54 years that he was in ministry. And out of that experience, he wrote a beautiful hymn that is in our book, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds Our Hearts in Christian Love. There is something about that tie that believers have that goes deeper, as I said earlier, than flesh and blood, that unites heart with heart and spirit with spirit, and that is not easily broken, and that forgives when it's wronged and brings back into blessed fellowship one with another. So let's uh, close with a song, and then we'll have a closing word of prayer. We're going to sing in closing, Lord, I'm coming home. And I chose that song because we're talking about a family reunion. Maybe you need to have a reunion with the Lord today. You need to come home to Him. And I'm not talking about dying and going to heaven. But you need to come home into a reunion with the Lord. You need a reunion with the Lord today? Lord, I'm coming home. Maybe there's a need for you to have a reunion with a brother or sister in the Lord. Lord, I'm coming home. Think about that as we sing these words. And then finally, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, He's the God that gave you physical life. 
And if you reject him, you'll have no spiritual life. You'll have no eternal life. You will be condemned forever. So why don't you come home to the Lord as well today?